Hello everyone and welcome to this video. I just wanted to make a quick disclaimer before the video starts that while I do mention specific channels within this video, I am by no means endorsing or criticizing these channels. I'm aware that these channels have come under criticism for other reasons. Uh, those will not be discussed within this video. I just wanted to make absolutely clear that while I seem to be pretty harsh and pretty critical of these things, I'm not saying that any of these people or these channels are really bad for these reasons specifically. They might be bad for other reasons, that's why I'm not endorsing them, but I just wanted to make it clear that I am not bashing them for wanting to earn money, wanting to become monetized on YouTube. Furthermore, I will be critiquing heavily the monetization and the advertisement aspects of YouTube. Once again, I don't, I'm not saying that people who do these things are bad. I don't believe they're bad people. Also, that if I ever was given the option, I wouldn't want to be monetized or, or be able to have sponsored ads on these videos. This is merely a critique, a kind of observation more so than saying that these are bad people. Once again, no bad people here. No one is bad for simply wanting to earn money and to make a living. Just that I think if you are to, going to have sponsored videos or if you're going to have monetization to be really aware of your content, um, this was largely also, my critique was also largely directed at more content that kind of appeases that kind of is made for children just because I also think if you are a kid, your perception, your ability to distinguish between content and advertisement is not as good, <laughs> right? So yeah, just a little disclaimer before the video starts. The story of YouTube is not unlike that of Facebook or Google, and like those, it's far from over. In 2005, the website was founded with the intention of creating a platform where people could share homemade videos. The first video, titled Me at the Zoo, was uploaded by one of its co-founders. This 19-second video features a man standing in front of an elephant enclosure. The video captures the intention of this platform, to simply showcase something interesting. The founder's intention was to open up a platform of which anyone can participate. Even today, in the About section on YouTube, it states that our values are based on four essential freedoms that define who we are. Freedom of expression, freedom of information, freedom of opportunity, freedom to belong. The four emphasis all offer something not found in other media forms like movies, television shows, and plays. The freedom of expression and information focuses on a lack of censorship. The creators were able to upload anything emphasis on war, as that is no longer quite the case. The freedom of opportunity allows anyone to upload, unlike the difficult process of making a movie, TV, or play. Lastly, the freedom to belong is explained by YouTube as their encouragement in community formation and cross-cultural outreach. Overall, YouTube began as a platform which countered the movie industry. YouTube was founded in 2005, and in 2021, 16 years after the beginning, the content on it has completely changed. Many YouTube channels have adopted the formula of regularly scheduled programming. YouTubers now often upload videos three times a week, and always on certain set dates. Not only has the schedule changed to resemble that of television, the content itself has as well. There are many different categories of video content, ranging from cooking videos to prank videos. Perhaps most obvious is the fact that each content creator has channels through which they would upload their videos. These channels would post contents of a specific type, similar to that of television. You do not watch HGTV expecting to see reruns of horror movies, and you do not go to the family channel expecting to see Bobby Flay competing against restaurant owners. Side note, YouTube also has their own TV streaming service bundle now. Sometimes in the 16 years from its inception, YouTube became the exact thing it was trying to oppose. In recent years, YouTube has become a primary source of income for many of its creators. For these content creators, it has become their career. A creator will get money from their videos if it is monetized. 
However, there are many other ways for a creator to get money. When the creators of the video opt for monetization, ads are placed in their videos and they will be paid for the number of times the ads are watched. This is the only way for its creators to earn an income through YouTube system. Outside of the systems, there are many other sources of income. Many YouTubers will have sponsorships for their videos. A company will sponsor someone to promote a product or service which they offer within one of their videos. A post on social media platform in exchange for money. YouTubers can also earn money through selling their own products. Many of them create clothing lines with their logo, channel names, some catchphrase which they say and sell it to their audience. With these two methods of income, the line between advertisement and content is blurred. In the progress bar of a YouTube video, the ads which YouTube themselves place will always be highlighted in yellow, highlighting that it is not a part of the content. However, when YouTubers take sponsorships or advertise their own merchandise, it is part of the content and not recognized as advertisement. There are more laws regarding sponsorship and it depends on the specific country the content creator is from, which dictates whether they have to make it explicit that it is a sponsor ad or not. Either way, YouTube does not recognize these portions as advertisement. A big portion of YouTube channels are dedicated to showcasing the everyday lives of creators. Even in cases where the channel's main focus is on something else, at one point or another, they'll make a video in which they take the viewers through their everyday life. These vlogs are edited to reflect just the most exciting parts of their lives, the highlights. However, it appears under the guise of their everyday life. This becomes similar to long television series like sitcoms, which show proportions of the characters' lives. These are scripted, planned, and strong along a storyline designed to make the viewers continue watching. However, YouTube becomes worse than the television or film industry it used to provide an escape from. These YouTube videos appear as mere presentations of YouTubers' life. Film and television have worked to achieve something which imitates life, and it has been successful and convincing. However, the film or television show is never separate from the production of it. In every movie, the credits roll through after the film is finished and the characters become separated from the actors and actresses that play these characters. The audience understands that the actors are portraying someone and are not, in fact, their character in real life. This distinction does not happen on YouTube. There is no distinction between the character in a YouTube video and the people in real life. However, this cannot be the case because these videos are now manufactured to be entertaining and to have people watching them, as that is the source of income for YouTubers. There's a contradiction here. The YouTubers must put on these storylines to engage the audience. However, at the same time, the character they play and who they are should be one and the same. An actor that portrays a character is never held accountable for the actions of that character. In fact, people often praise actors for portraying evil characters well. But YouTubers are criticized for not being quote-unquote authentic when people find out that they are different people in real life. Their work and their life becomes inseparable. The movie is a product of a studio, and the characters in the movie becomes part of that product. The character only exists in the movie and for the movie, and this is separate from the actors who exist outside of the movie. For a YouTuber, their product is their video, and they become part of the product because they are supposed to present their authentic selves within the video. There lacks the distinction between the actor and the character. The purpose of this in YouTube's origin was to create a space for content which was unlike Hollywood films. The character is never supposed to exist because the videos were supposed to be unedited presentations of lives. However, through the 16 years, the platform has had a reversal. Instead of the characters not existing, the actor ceases to exist. The YouTuber is no longer themselves, but rather must always be the character which they portray in their videos. Lukash, a philosopher of the Frankfurt School, describes reification as, quote, the split between the worker's labor power and his personality, its metamorphosis into a thing, an object that he sells on the market. The process of working makes the worker become another part of the product, like another bolt or screw. 
Lukash criticizes this for making the worker become a quote unquote thing, which removes them from participating in dialectics, in creating change. When the worker becomes an object, they are taken out of time, and this time is what allows the dialectical process and change to occur. Lukash had applied this to the proletariat workers. Almost a hundred years after Lukash began writing about this matter, YouTube has become more sinister than the system which Lukash originally critiques. Lukash recognizes that the worker becomes separated into parts which are sellable. In most cases, this will be in their time and a specific skill which they know that transforms the worker themselves into a commodity. In the case of YouTube, the entire person becomes something which can be sold. The personality becomes the labor power, which is then an object he sells on the market. This comes with the lack of distinction between the character and the actor. The actor sells the part of them which acts as that character needed for a film. But since there is no difference for the YouTuber, they are selling themselves in the process of selling the character. While the character becomes part of the commodity of a movie, the YouTuber becomes part of the commodity of their video. This participation within the commodity forever places a part of them outside of time, which allows for the process of reification. Because the video converts time into digital space, it does not change over time and thus becomes commodified. This also places the person within the video out of time. The part of them now only exists spatially as an object. Since there is no separation between the person in the video and the person outside of the video, the person outside of the video is also subjected to space. Although this process of reification looks very different from the one described by Lukash in his essay on reification, it is not so different. Lukash writes that the cause of reification is that the worker is now selling their hours of work as commodities, while separating it from their personal lives. This is actually still the case, but for the YouTuber, their personal life no longer exists since they are always at work. I will not be going more into Lukash within this essay. If you are interested in learning more about Lukash and his theories, I'm sure there are many more resources online that can clarify for you. Within the essay, I use the book History and Class Consciousness. The problem with YouTube is perhaps most accurately captured by one YouTuber when she was questioned about how she films. I have tried to find the sources to cite within this essay, and I cannot find the specific video or the source where this happens. But I'm sure you can imagine how this would be the case. I also want to just make a disclaimer now that I am not, by any means, endorsing or suggesting this person or promoting them. I'm just using them as a case study. I'm also not condemning them necessarily. I, to be honest, don't know enough about this person to really make a comment on them. The YouTuber Gabby Hanna is a part of a channel consistent of a group of friends that take videos of their time hanging out together and upload it onto YouTube. I'm also aware that this is no longer the case, I think, but this interview happened when they were still this inter this interview happened when she was still part of that group. The interviewer asked Hannah if they would spend time together without having their cameras with them. She replied that they would spend time together. However, they would always bring their cameras with them. She explained that they would make plans to go out and not film, but they would at least have a camera with them, quote unquote, just in case anything were to occur. There's no longer any time the YouTuber is not at work, precisely because they can work any time. Furthermore, their life outside of work cannot be more quote unquote fun or exciting than the one where they are at work, because if moments of their life reflects those qualities, it must be captured and made into a video. There is no coincidence that the videos that get most views are those depicting important moments in a YouTuber's life. All these moments become content potential, which in turn earns them a profit. Adorno and Horkheimer critiques the entertainment industry within their essay, The Culture Industry, Enlightenment as Mass Deception, especially with regards to Hollywood film. Once again, I'll be using their theories within this paper. I will not be fully explaining their theories, and if you are interested in learning more about them, you should definitely be able to find great resources online that go into more, more thorough discussion. They claim that, quote, films and radio no longer need to present themselves as art. The truth that they are nothing but business is used as an ideology to legitimize the trash they intentionally produce. This has been demonstrated by the numerous sequels, third and fourth of movies under the same title. 
the industry finds a formula which it then repeats for every film as long as it continues to earn an income. For the industry to continue their gain, they need the consumer to continue buying the content. For the consumer, entertainment is the prolongation of work under late capitalism. The consumer's leisure time must be spent participating in the culture industry. The consumer's time can be split into the time they are at work and the time they are not. As Lukas argues, the time they are at work, the consumer is no longer a person but a thing. Adorno and Horkheimer argues that during the time they are not at work, is spent consuming in the mass culture, which in return becomes work. The consumer, like the content creator, is perpetually also at work. YouTube moves beyond the critique of both Lukas and Adorno and Horkheimer. The YouTuber is always at work and always consuming mass entertainment. They often consume mass culture to be relevant, but at the same time, they must showcase mass culture within their videos. It becomes a cycle which feeds into itself. This is far worse than the film industry described by Adorno and Horkheimer. While the film industry seeks to imitate life, which then seeps out of the screen and into life, the YouTube video appears as mere presentation of life. Because this platform was created in spite of the film industry's dishonesty, there appears to be an illusion of honesty which no longer exists. This makes the audience even more susceptible in taking a video as true presentation when it does not exist. While the film credits the director, editor, and actor, the YouTube video does not. They maintain the illusion that they are just an ordinary person, not professionals standing in front of the camera. Instead of challenging the industry, they have hidden it. There seems to be no room in criticizing the YouTube industry. While the film industry is at least transparent about its attempt at imitation, YouTube completely hides it. The audience takes all the edited videos as presentations of life. For the YouTubers, this becomes necessary for them to earn money. The audience is more susceptible to advertisement when they believe that it is not advertisement. The advertisement now seems like a recommendation by a friend. Furthermore, the advertisement is hidden by the feature of monetization. Because YouTube makes a distinction when they place ads within videos, the audience is led to believe that when something is not explicitly shown as an ad, it must not be. I want to make a quick note here. I'm not referring to every single person that watches the video, and I think more and more people are becoming more aware of how much advertisement there actually is within the video, especially with sponsored content. But I do think there are people that still believe that. If something is not explicitly an ad, it might not be. Especially considering some YouTubers don't make very explicitly clear when they are showing, when they are showcasing a sponsored ad. The YouTuber now is able to earn money from videos monetization both within the system of YouTube and outside of the system. Content and advertising becomes completely blurred in this area. The fan that admires the YouTuber now believes that they can become their idol if they also have what the person behind the camera recommends. Another quick note: I think this is especially true for younger audiences of YouTube videos. This phenomenon perhaps best demonstrates the capability of capitalism in adapting and absorbing any criticism towards it. While YouTube was created as a platform which would offer something different from Hollywood films, it has further embedded itself in that industry, to the point where it has now surpassed Hollywood. This directly parallels Adorno and Horkheimer's critique of enlightenment. They claim that quote, just as myth already entails enlightenment, with every step enlightenment entangles itself more deeply in mythology. This is exactly the trajectory in which YouTube has gone. While the film industry has sought to imitate the appearance of presentation of YouTube videos, YouTube has become more involved in the imitation of the film industry. YouTube is a seemingly undefeatable system, as it removes the transparency of the film industry, one that has already seemed to be impossible to stop. The YouTube video, unlike entertainment forms, gain value whether the audience enjoys the content or not. The like and dislike buttons are illusions of consumer power over the content. The fact that the viewer has already watched a video means that the creator has already gotten their money. A video does not need to be liked to earn money; it only needs to be watched. If a movie receives a bad review from a critic, it could do poorly at the box office. 
However, because it does not actually cost anything to watch a YouTube video, because of this, it is so much easier for disliked content to do well. The consumer just needs to pay with their time. YouTube is not an infallible platform. While it has become a career option, the length of the career seems to be shorter and shorter. The original popular channels on YouTube have all seemingly left in a refusal to participate in what YouTube has become. Recently, many new popular YouTube channels have also been involved in scandals, which actually exposed the fabrication of YouTube itself a little bit more at a time. Perhaps the best example of this are the multiple critique channels which have gained an audience within YouTube. Another note here, I'm aware now there are different distinctions between different critique channels, like there are drama channels, there are commentary channels. I don't mean to generalize and I do actually think a lot of these channels have really, really great content. Just for the sake of the video, I have lumped it all together as critique channels. For example, a channel named Spill makes videos which look at specific scandals and work through why it happened and what issue it actually addresses. She critiques the YouTube industry, the platform that has allowed this to happen while being on this platform. This essay will do the same. This simultaneously shows the potential of freedom of this platform, but at the same time, the monopoly it has. Furthermore, at the end of the most recent video, this was a video from a while ago. I watched it while I was doing this research. This is no longer a recent video. Um, she promoted her new clothing line. She has never monetized her videos. Another note, I don't think this is the case anymore. Once again, this was from an older time. I've been researching this essay for a while and that's why the information seems to be a little old. Um, but anyways, and even that one is not monetized. However, as discussed earlier, this hidden form of advertisement is more insidious. Once again, I'm not criticizing Spill's channel. I'm also aware that why I addressed the channel in its entirety as quote unquote she, I have become aware that it is more of a company or corporate now. There becomes a question of whether the cure truly exists, or if it's just a quote, a medicine bath which the entertainment industry never ceases to prescribe. The critique videos are engulfed into the YouTube industry, and the criticism in turn feeds more into the industry. It seems that there becomes a point of growth of every channel where the temptation of money triumphs. While monetization becomes a standard form of advertisement, it seems that when the creator wants to pursue a YouTube career, it is impossible not to use other forms of advertisement. YouTube moves beyond Adorno and Horkheimer's critique of the culture industry as well as Lukash's idea of reification to create an industry which makes every minute work time. The platform has moved beyond what Lukash had anticipated of the separation of the working hours. The YouTuber is always working, and every aspect of their life can be used and commodified. Furthermore, entertainment and work have literally become the same for the YouTuber. They have moved beyond Adorno and Horkheimer's critique of the imitative ability of film, which leads to its ability to become the standard. Because YouTube videos appear as presentation, it no longer needs to create the illusion of presentation. It is merely assumed by the consumer. This ultimately leads to the breakdown of the barrier between content and advertisement. The content creator can use both YouTube's monetization to earn money, but also disguise the advertisement within their content. Adorno and Horkheimer predicts this trajectory when they say that advertisement becomes simply the art, and this has never been more true than within the platform of YouTube. Thank you for watching the video. Once again, Another disclaimer, I know I probably sound like a broken record. Just once again, a disclaimer, please, please do not think I hate these channels or I hate YouTube and YouTube. If you are watching this, I don't hate you. I think you still retain a lot of these values that you start with and you're still able to give a lot of different people, different creators voices that they would have never been able to get in traditional Hollywood, the film industry, or the TV industry and things like that. But yeah, 
if you enjoyed the video please like this video um and yeah see you in the next one